This is Dr. Jerome Corsi, and today is Wednesday. It's October 18th, 2023. We want to start out today with uh, going back to the Middle East on uh, the war which Israel declared against Hamas is heating up. Uh, yesterday, there was an incident in the um, at Gaza where a hospital was attacked. Now, there's a, the controversy over the hospital being attacked is who did it? Who attacked the hospital? And, of course, the Hamas is saying Israel attacked the hospital, and then that's, that's gone off in its own dynamic, with the whole idea being that if the Israelis attack the hospital, Israelis are vicious because they have now made it impossible for people to get medical care. They killed about 500 people. But the other part of the story is, you know, th there was an explosion. They, th that's known. It killed about 500 people, according to Gaza authorities, including staff, patients, and civilians, who had taken refuge inside the hospital following this evacuation order from Israel. Uh, and again, the precise death toll is uncertain, and certainly the likelihood is it's been exaggerated for political purposes. But who's to blame? I mean, the Palestinian officials blamed the blast on an Israeli airstrike. The Israeli military said it was caused by a rocket fired by a Palestinian Islamic Jihad military group based in Gaza. The uh, Israeli military said an analysis of its operation system showed that the militant group fired a volley of rockets near the hospital when it was hit. The source of the blast could not be independently verified. Now, this is typical of what goes on in the Middle East in these kinds of conflicts because the, the whole modus operandi of Hamas has been that Israel is evil. They want to get Israel out of the Middle East. And if you read the Hamas charter or study Hamas, and again, I'm going to refer back to my book, Atomic Iran, which I wrote in 2006, uh, they... I analyze this very thoroughly. I'm going to start putting this book up for sale next week. And uh, I have copies. I'm going to sign them. But Atomic Iran said that Hamas was a very, very militant organization. It was founded to destroy Israel. Like Iran, which backs Hamas, Iran has a declared purpose. There's Atomic Iran. I thought it was a great. I love the cover of that book when it came out. It was right after I wrote Unfit for Command with John O'Neill, co-authored it, uh, on John Kerry. And the whole point of Atomic Iran was that it's a, you've got to understand that the militant Islamic groups headed by Iran, funded by Iran, which include Hamas and Hezbollah, are dedicated to the destruction of Israel. They There's no middle ground. And they have played games with this for years, decades, getting funded by the international community, which supports Hamas, it supports the, the, the Middle East Muslims against the Jews. Now, the history of this is in 1948, after World War II. World War II was stigmatized by the concentration camps in which the Nazis rounded up and killed some six million Jews in a vicious way. I've been to Auschwitz twice, one of the death camps. These were horrible places. This was hell on earth. It was satanic. They ripped families out of their homes. Uh, these are Germans who would have fought for Germany because they were Jews. And Hitler went through all the conquered countries. Hungary it was probably last, and they took Jews out of Hungary and killed them just towards the end of the war. Hitler was killing Jews right through the end of the war, diverting resources from the military to round up and kill Jews. It was insane. So coming out of World War II, there was a international sympathy when the concentration camps had been filmed by uh, the allies coming in and liberating these camps. It, it, the horror of the world was struck. No one could believe it. These skeletal figures, the mounds of skeletons burned in, in gas chambers and uh, you know, put in 
gas chambers and taken out to ovens and their corpses burned. Uh, this, these were insane cruelty places. So the motive was to create Israel. And there was a vote taken in the United Nations in 1948 to partition Palestine, which would have allowed the creation of the state of Israel. And Harry Truman made the decision to do it as president, which was not a popular decision with the CIA or with the State Department. Uh, the American people favored it, but the elite did not. The elite did not favor Israel being created. Uh, there was an uh, exodus of people from Europe trying to get into Israel to establish at least a Jewish state. Well, th th this Jew hatred, which has been going on for centuries, is one of the great mental diseases of the human race. And uh, it's going on again. So Hamas likes to take hostages as shields so that they can hide behind the hostages. So Israel faces a moral dilemma as to whether or not they kill innocent people, including Jews or Israeli citizens in order to get to Hamas. Hamas will create incidents where the streets in Gaza, and I've, I've been in these places, I've been to Gaza, I've seen these places, dirt streets, children running around as if this was the, you know, two centuries ago, barely clothed, dirty. The thing is a mess. And billions of dollars have gone into the Gaza to the Palestinian authorities, and it's been taken by the leaders of the Palestinian movement. Yasser Arafat had millions of dollars. Yasser Arafat was not a Palestinian. He was born in Egypt. The whole story of Hamas and these organizations is that the Jews dislodged um, Palestinians from their homes in the 1948 war. The day that the United Nations voted in 1948 to create Israel by partitioning Palestine, Egypt went to war against Israel. So you had, at that era, Nasser, who was the head of Egypt, declared war, and, and uh, you had the Jews wake, wake, woken up in the middle of the night, told that they'd created a company, country, and now they were under attack. The 1948 war was a vicious war. It was like a guerrilla war. That's how the Israelis fought it. The Israelis won. Now, the whole issue of the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinians really did not exist as a people. M most of the Palestinians or the residents, the Arab residents of what's now Israel, remained where they were. There's a, there's a large Muslim population in Israel. And uh, they even they vote. They have, I believe they have a seat in the Knesset or more than one now. And the point is that the Israelis are not about to abandon Israel. You get all these solutions, two-state solution, all these different things. And when these incidents happen, Hamas is not above attacking their own hospital to blame it on Israel. And then the world press turns against the Israel. Now, this is at a time when we have Biden coming into Israel, and he thought he was coming in to uh, be able to negotiate and maybe resolve the peace. First of all, Biden probably doesn't even know where he is unless somebody gets him full of some kind of drug or other that makes him cogent for a few minutes. He obviously, some suffering some form of dementia. We have a president of the United States suffering senior dementia, which is a disgrace. You know, only this woke elite or the Obama factions, which want to control from behind the scenes or whomever is the puppet master, uh, so Biden's over there now, and because this incident happened, all the meetings Biden had set up are being canceled. He was going to meet with the various, you know, Egyptian and the Syrians and this group and that group to try to mediate the situation, and they're all being canceled now because this incident has inflamed everybody's emotions again. Now remember, this started out with Hamas attacking on October 7th, about some of the thousand or fifteen hundred attackers, you know, coming in to from from Gaza, attacking the villages, some twenty villages and kibbutzes along the border. Now, there's another story out. It was covered today by the Wall Street Journal, which I found very interesting because what they pointed out was that there was this one kibbutz that was armed and trained for this kind of an incident. So when the Hamas terrorists came in. What they did is they 
they you know blew up the barriers that were protecting the kibbutz they flooded into the area the kibbutz they had maps of the area they knew what they were looking for and they were going after people's homes to kill them some of the homes they were burned alive within the house in other instances they took the the you know, civilians in the, in the kibbutz as hostages and this one group fought back they were armed with with military grade you know m16s and other weapons ak47s and the like they were trained uh, they had helmets vests they were military ready like a militia there were people who lived in the kibbutz trained for this just this kind of an incident and they fought back and they won they beat back the terrorists now israel has also been going through this leftist movement as we have in the united states one of the major aims of the left is to disarm the population to attack the second amendment and attack the first amendment in order to disarm the population because an armed population can resist when the uh, in israel it's very difficult to get the permission to have a weapon and the left has made it almost impossible to do it when i have gone to israel going back decades the people in israel were armed you'd see military walking around the cities with military uniforms and their military weapons because it was dangerous uh, the terrorists in those days were blowing up buses they were killing people there were a lot of random attacks of terrorist bombers in those years and the israeli citizens were prepared to handle it today many in israel are disarmed and they had no defense so against this attack they were they couldn't fight back they were just victims because they were defenseless. This, is, I think, is an important lesson for the world. Now, where is it going? Where it goes from here is it expands into a regional war. Israel is ready to go into Gaza. They've told people to evacuate. Evacuating Gaza is a disaster because there's about 1.2 million people that live there. It's a little tiny strip of land. Of course, you can show it on the map if you would, please. You can see how... Israel is also vulnerable from the north from Lebanon, which was Hezbollah, which is a different terrorist organization, also funded and formed by Iran, the one of the buddies of Ayatollah Khomeini, who was with him in exile in Iraq, went and formed Hezbollah as uh, with basically Sunni roots, but yet in a kind of hybrid organization, which is also Shiite. And the Shiites, which is Iran, are a minority in Islam, but they're a majority in Iran. And they have a very radical belief, which is that the, the Prophet's family should dominate Islam. That's what the Shiites believe. They believe this little boy from the Prophet's family went down a well centuries ago and is in hiding. And he'll come out of hiding when there's an apocalypse. And the apocalypse, meaning a world war, will be the triumph of Shiite Islam because this Mahdi, which is what they call him, will be divinely blessed, blessed and they will win. Now, when I was, I've told the story repeatedly, when I was in Israel last, about well, maybe 2009, when I was there for quite a while, I did meet with Yalon, who was the vice chairman of the country. And we talked about Ezekiel 37, 38. I didn't know I was gonna meet him. They called me up, said, Dr. Corsi, get ready. Um, at the hotel, I got ready. I, until I got into the room and met him, I wasn't sure the meeting was going to happen. And I asked him very bluntly, I mean, you know, you know Iran's going to develop nuclear weapons, and he did. What are you going to do? He said, well, how hard do you think it would be for us to put out all the lights in the Middle East except our own? Well, I, I got the picture. And in fact, that's what they're doing in Gaza. They turned back on the water for a while yesterday, they're trying to get the people to evacuate, but of course Hamas is trying to get them not to evacuate. Hamas would, will sacrifice all these people that Hamas does not care if they're killed. Hamas wants to destroy Israel. And this is the beginning of what could be a final attempt to destroy Israel, in which I can see the Syria. Uh, I don't think Egypt will get back involved. I don't think Jordan will get involved militarily. But I think Hezbollah and Hamas will lead the charge and Syria will join in. Uh, but diplomatically, 
none of the Arab states are going to be cooperative right now because they all have to support the Muslim movement, even though countries like Saudi Arabia could live with, just like Egypt, could live today with Israel. But Iran cannot. And Iran, uh, the mullahs, which are this small group of clerics coming out of Ayatollah Khomeini, and one of the problems right now is that the revolution happened in 1979 when Jimmy Carter was president. Okay, now 1979, it, that's already 40 years ago. More, more getting on to 45 years ago. Now, by the time we get to 50 years ago, a lot of people who are listening to this broadcast, a lot of people who are active and coming active today as adults, have no recollection. They weren't born. This is like ancient history. For those of us who lived through it, the Iran, when Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran, they deposed the Shah of Iran. Jimmy Carter would not give the Shah exile. Jimmy Carter left the Shah to wander around because Jimmy Carter said the Ayatollah Khomeini was, he was welcoming him. Again, the Democrats have all supported the Muslim movement, the radical Muslim movement. Obama did the same. When I was in Israel in 2009, Obama was in Cairo meeting again with Islamic groups, he gave a big speech internationally broadcast in which he said he had experienced Islam on three continents, something he had denied throughout the campaign running for president in 2008. But I wrote Abomination at that time, which was number one New York Times bestseller. And I pointed out that Obama was in Indonesia with his stepfather, Lolo, Lolo Sotoro. His name at that time was Barry Sotoro. And Barry Sotoro was registered as a child in a school in Indonesia as a Muslim. He was raised as a Muslim. Then he was in Hawaii, okay, and again with his grandparents who raised him. And his father, he was told, was Obama Sr., who was an African. When Obama went to Africa finally, I believe in the 80s, first time, he found that his family there was also Muslim. So the three continents, Indonesia, uh, continental United States, or Hawaii at least, and then he, was, he went to school supposedly at the University of Chicago. I'm, I'm yet to be convinced he really attended. He went to Harvard Law School. But the sympathy of the American left is with radical Islam. Now you say, why? I mean, first of all, radical Islam detests homosexuals. The, they're not with the LGBT movement, which is at the core of the radical neo-Marxist Democrats. But because the Radical Islamic movement in Iran says death to Israel and death to America. We're the great Satan. I mean, the old debate, you know, we're the great Satan, Israel's a little Satan to, to Iran. The American left, the radical left, the neo-Marxists agree with Islam because it is anti-American, as are they. The Democratic Party has become a communist party. It's a neo-Marxist party. And they have taken neo-Marxist ideology and implanted it within Islam, all to destroy America and destroy capitalism. So Israel is going to be fighting here for survival. And what Yalon told me is, he said, we will defend Israel regardless what it takes. He said, we're prepared. We, you know, we understand what the threats are and uh, we'll defend Israel, which means this could escalate into a nuclear war. And we could be at the very beginning of what could, could develop into World War III. We've certainly got Ukraine going on. Well, today the attention is drained from Ukraine. Uh, people are getting tired of it. Even the American left in the newspapers are getting tired of reporting on Ukraine because Ukraine is not winning. Putin's in firm control of the territory he's taken in Ukraine, which is the territory he wants in the east and on the seacoast of the, of the Black Sea. The east is largely Russian historically. Many of the people speak Russian in the Donbass area. And he wants control along the coast of the Black Sea because at Sevastopol, the great naval port, Crimea, these are critical posts for getting into the Mediterranean for southern access for Russia into the Mediterranean. So you have a structure here where we've got a war going on in Ukraine that Putin's got control over. Putin's made an alliance with Iran and China's involved with the two of them. Putin and China are together. 
you know, planning this BRICS nation, which is, you know, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, expanded to include several of the, of the oil producing Arab states. And Saudi Arabia realizes, because it's Sunni, that they'll be the next target of Iran. If Iran could destroy the United States, Iran could destroy Israel, and Iran's on the verge of being able to try to do both. And they will next go after Saudi Arabia. Iran will not quit until all these Sunni states, which is the majority of Islam, are attacked. But we, what we saw yesterday was throughout the Middle East, and it will soon happen in Europe, the Muslims were protesting in the streets very violently against U.S. consulates, against Israeli consulates, and that violence will continue. The tension in the Middle East builds very rapidly. And if Israel does go into the Gaza, uh, Israel will be very quickly demonized by the United Nations, and Israel will be blamed for a war it did not start. I mean, that's how insane this is, and I've been there many times. I've talked with the leaders. I've seen it. I've experienced it, and I can tell you it's this is what's going to happen, and we're going to have now, for the next period of time, a massive destabilization. Chris, you want to comment? Well, we can't say we weren't warned. Uh, I know we could talk about the last uh, few thousand years, but let's go back a couple of centuries. Uh, a uh, fine gentleman who was at this point an ex-president, a man named John Quincy Adams, wrote, the, pre the precept of the, of the Quran is, and I'm quoting this from him, perpetual war against all who deny that Muhammad is the prophet of God. The vanquished may purchase their lives by the payment of tribute. The victorious may be appeased by a false and delusive promise of peace, and the faithful follower of the prophet may, su may submit to the imperilous necessities of defeat, but the command to propagate the Muslim creed by the sword is always obligatory when it can be made effective. The commands of the prophet may be performed alike by fraud or by force. That's a warning from former president at the time, John Quincy Adams, before he went to Congress. Well, and that's, you know, again, it's prescient. It, it is it, any number. I can recall any number of peace efforts that have been made. He's playing, the, it's playing out today. Yeah. <laughs> at the White House, you, you did, uh, you've got Biden over there again. We have had... Uh, Egypt and Israel at the White House signing agreements. We've had, you know, major accords. Jimmy Carter wanted to do this. Uh, Clinton wanted to do it. Even Trump wanted to do it. Trump was getting all the Muslim nations to do these agreements saying that they would go along with Israel and allow Israel to survive. He was trying to get the Middle East stabilized where Israel was legitimate and the Arab and Muslim countries worked with Israel, which would be productive for the Middle East. But you've got this element in Islam which doesn't go away, and that is the radical element of Iran today where they'll make peace to make war. It's just a temporary condition for them. They don't really mean fundamental peace because they don't accept that the Jews have a right to exist. They don't believe the Jews have a right to they, 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 like Hitler, would kill every Jew in the face of the earth if they could. And I mean, they're not too fond of the rest of us either. So, well, that Jews, after the Jews, they go after the Christians. And right now in the Middle East, Christians are being persecuted left and right. And again, brutally beheaded uh, women, children, they don't care. Uh, they, they are blood, bloodthirsty when they get into this jihadist movement with the sword and it it is not stoppable quickly because they're very well armed we've been sending you know obama sent airplanes full of money to iran we're sending uh we we're going to send another nine billion dollars or something for the release of a couple hostages biden was the biden administration is absolutely a disgrace and it's uh, it should be apparent to all americans that Biden shouldn't is not capable of being president. And the idea that he's going to run for re-election, I think, is a joke. I think even the Democrats don't want him to run for re-election. And I'm predicting, and as is Joel Gilbert, that probably Michelle is over here waiting in the background. <laughs> and well, Michelle, we're busy. <laughs> well, I've gotten a lot of comments on the, you know, and I, I do read, and I'm going to try to respond a little bit more to the comments people are posting, but I know the difficulties with Michelle but she's been very strongly repositioned. 
you know, wrote an autobiography and another book, did a book tour. She's changed the look of her, you know, so she's more soft and fuzzy, not the hard radical. She's appeared on Oprah and all kinds of shows. She's very popular. It's the repositioning Obama did when he wrote Dreams for My Father, when he gave the speech, you know, the 2000, I guess 2004 Democratic Convention where he said, you know, there's not a red America, there's not a blue America, we're all Americans. You know, all that kind of stuff that he positioned himself as a moderate until you know, essentially I, I wrote a abomination and pointed out he'd been trained by Frank Marshall Davis, who was a card carrying communist to the 1950s in Chicago, who was repositioned in Hawaii in order to cause the strikes and the labor unrest with the Marxists at that time thought they could take over Hawaii and it would be the first communist uh, enclave, first communist state in the United States in the process of making all of America communist, which now they're trying to accomplish and getting pretty far along in the way until I think finally the American people are beginning to wake up. So I want to transition to another couple of stories here, Chris, because it, uh, it, it, these things take a little bit of time to explain, but there's two stories which I think validate that uh, we're going into a serious economic downturn. And by the way, do get a copy of this free book. You can get it, uh, put up the number, Chris, and we'll talk about it for just a minute. I've written a book, How the Coming Global Crash Will Create an Historic Gold Rush, and it's beginning to happen because you're finding out increasingly, this is the book right here, How Coming Global Crash Can Create an Historic Gold Rush, and you can get a free copy by talking to Swiss America. Do talk to Swiss America. They're a very well known, and I've, I've worked with them for since 2004, uh, and they've sponsored me since 2004. I'm Dean Heskin, who's the head of Swiss America, co-authored the book with me. And the book, if you call this number, you'll get a free copy of the whole the coming global crash will create an historic gold rush. The number is 1-800-519-6268. I'm going to repeat that. 1-800-519-6268. And do call them. Because even if you don't have a lot of money to invest, if gold starts rising, as I think it's going to rise, you'll be able to benefit from that by having some money in a currency that won't depreciate. And right now, you're going to see currencies with inflation continuing having less purchasing power. You can measure inflation with how much it buys, the purchasing power. And right now, with having a, a fiat currency in this modern monetary theory, you're finding that printing money is in fashion around the world. We're now at something like almost $400 trillion dollars in that international debt from the countries that have basically been just printing money. Gold now is up to $1,961.50. When gold breaks $2,000, and, and there's increasing predictions that gold will be trading above $2,000 an ounce in, two, in 2024 as we enter this economic crisis, which is building. So uh, do yourself a favor and get the book. The book describes... You know, in detail, two things. One, it shows how we are, in fact, having a combination of a debt crisis, which will cause commercial real estate and the housing market in the U.S. to collapse. That's like what happened in 2008 and 2009. Again, we have a very short historical memory, but that was when Obama was coming into office and we had banks failing. We had Lehman Brothers, which, you know, the derivatives, once the subprime real estate market collapsed, the collateralized mortgage obligation securities collapsed, and then the derivatives collapsed. And the derivatives are extremely hard to understand, but they are trillions of dollars. So we got a national debt, and also combined with the running out of you know, high energy prices. And Europe is now cut off from Russian gas. We're going to have, I think, we could see $200 barrel of oil. We're certainly going to see $100 barrel a cost for a barrel of oil very soon with what's going on in the Middle East. These wars are economically destructive. Uh, and we're going to pour a lot of money again that's now the the arms industry, the military industrial complex, 
time to make their payday, just like the pharmaceutical companies were given their payday during the COVID. Uh, and this is combined uh, with the move to de-dollarize, the move to create central bank digital currencies. We're going through some massive shifts. We're entering a new, we're ending one era. It's like a paradigm shift. And these shifts from these paradigms are very, very traumatic. We're going to have to live through this one. We've got the combination now of an oil crisis like the 1973 oil embargo, which caused gas lines all around the United States, led to stagflation, which we're going into now. So gold went from $35 an ounce, 1971, when Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard, to 1980, Ronald Reagan came in and gold hit $843 an ounce, 843 Then with the subprime real estate collapse in 2008, 2009, Gold hit $1,426 an ounce. COVID, gold hit an all-time high of $2,074.60 on March 8, 2022. Do yourself a favor. Get a free copy of the book and talk to Swiss America. The two stories I wanted to cover and will, Germany, which is now de-industrializing because Germany has closed its nuclear power plants. Germany will have to start up coal plants in order to get through the winter. Uh, Germany is now facing a construction industry collapse because interest rates have started to rise. Germany had negative interest rates for a considerable period of time. And you've had the collapse now of some of the big uh, groups that produce a commercial real estate. So one, one group in Dusseldorf with, with $4 billion in construction projects just declared bankruptcy. Another group in Munich that has built big projects around the country, they're doing emergency property sales and they are falling through. Uh, companies that do commercial office buildings, there's almost no need to do, build more commercial office bu bu buildings anywhere in the Western Europe or the United States because people are not coming back to work. And these office buildings are largely empty, 30 to 50% empty, which means that when they refinance, they're gonna, somebody's gonna take a big loss because they have to be refinanced at a much lower price. And many of these commercial real estate deals pay off the principal at the refinancing. That works fine when the building's appreciating in value. When the building is depreciating in value, you don't get enough money in the refinancing to pay off the previous uh, principal on the previous loan. That's where these buildings default. And they will also then default in the collateralized, collateralized mortgage obligations into which that commercial real estate building's loan had been packaged, which will hit the derivatives. This becomes a systemic collapse where one thing causes the collapse of the next, the collapse of the commercial real estate market, the bankruptcies being refinanced will cause collateralized mortgage obligations to default, which will in turn cause the derivatives to start failing. Derivatives fail, that's where Billions of dollars of loss are taken instantly, and companies can't recover from it. Uh, AIG barely survived in 2008, 2009 because of derivatives. Derivative bets are complex. If you make them right, you hedge against all kinds of interest rate fluctuations. If you bet wrong, you don't hedge properly because a black swan scenario happened you hadn't anticipated, you're gone, and there's no recovery. And that's where Lehman Brothers closed and several others closed. Bear Stearns closed. These were historic names on Wall Street. And um, I never thought they, I spent a lot of time on Wall Street. I still have all my securities licenses. I created two broker dealers. I had a long financial career. The other story I want to cover here is that Hoovervilles are starting up again. Okay, so during the Depression, 1930s, when people lost their homes, lost their jobs, couldn't find a job, they moved into these shanty towns. They created one in Central Park. They created several in Washington, D.C. They were just you know, cardboard shacks that they lived in. And they went to the soup kitchens to get fed. And the, they, you, know, you couldn't get rid of them. They, finally, in Washington, they mobilized the U.S. Army to get the, there was a whole group that were coming in from World War I. They wanted their promised pension now. And uh, these were thrown out very brutally by 
General MacArthur led the U.S. troops that broke up the shanty towns when these World War I veterans were in Washington demanding their pension. And that was that served to cause deep resentment against General MacArthur for generations. Now, again, most people don't know this history. But the point is that if we start getting RVs, where people are living in the RVs, because what's happened is in 2011, the average price of a home was $200,000. And it more than doubled in a decade because the from 2020 to 2023, the median price, median meaning half above, half below in the U.S., went from $320,000 to $420,000, a 33% increase in only three years. That's a bubble. A bubble's going to burst. People are finding that on 7.5%, about to be 8% interest on a 30-year fixed mortgage, it's unaffordable. So people are not putting their houses up for sale because they would just have to buy another one which would have a much higher interest rate cost. They'd be paying much more on their monthly mortgage costs. They sit tight. So there's a shrinkage in inventory. And the houses that are out there at inflated prices are having to be reduced in price in order to sell in this market. So this is about a housing bubble that's really about ready to burst. And what one of the articles I covered said in the Great Depression, the proliferation of Hoovervilles, shantytowns, and charity soup lines became an iconic symbol of the scale of financial calamity. Um, the, these kids, of, uh, th these collapses, at, you know, are not obvious in our era, but it's beginning to happen again. Because when people start living in RVs, you get these RV settlements developing. Of course, an RV or these tiny homes. I mean, if you're willing to live in le less space. You can find a living space and a lot less money. The next alternative is to become homeless, and the homelessness is growing. These are not being reported. Democratic cities being flooded by homelessness and crime is underreported right now because it's politically inappropriate to point out that the Democrats are causing economic collapse, and we're in the middle not only of a big war, but also of an economic collapse. We're going to have both at the same time. And Taiwan is sitting over here. Any day, China could t launch a military attack on China. And we've got two aircraft carrier groups, two of our biggest, uh, which is you know the USS Eisenhower uh, just joined the Gerald Ford Aircraft Carrier Task Force. These are huge aircraft carriers. They're so big, we don't have a dry dock in which they could be repaired, big enough. And we have two massive strike forces with aircraft carrier capability right now in the Mediterranean, expecting this to be a all-out war any day. Last story I want to cover is, uh, again, on the climate change insanity. And what you find is that the EV market is um, largely collapsing because uh, the car, people aren't buying them. Uh, you see the automakers, which had huge hopes for EVs, we're all going EV, we're going to transition to sun, solar and wind. And by the way, when, when a war is going to break out of this magnitude, LGBT, who do you think people are really going to focus on that? I think they're going to focus on climate change when we're at the edge of a nuclear war. Uh, worry about Ukraine when the news is dominated by Israel. Then the news shifts and it's dominated by Taiwan once it gets attacked. We're into a massive systemic collapse, which will soon impact the economy and all these fiat currencies, including the United States, will be printing money like mad, which we already are. And the curve will accelerate. In other words, we're going to go from 33 trillion in national debt to 34 trillion in lightning speed. We're going to get warp speed here on the accumulation of national debt. We're already have more national debt than we have GDP, gross domestic product. And that's clearly a warning sign. Uh, and these things are, the collapse that's going to occur will be a rush to gold. And the central banks have known it. They've been stocking up on gold for the past two years, been reporting on it, and people just have not caught on. The time to catch on 
to a massive gold rush is when it's starting. It's like when you own stocks and the market collapses, if you don't get out right away, you're stuck because you'll have to sell at a deep loss. Then you have to hold on to it and maybe wait years before that comes back to a value where it was before the market collapsed. I'm, I'm warning people that equities right now are dangerous. Even bonds are difficult. And I would solidly encourage getting some money in gold now while the getting is good. So, Chris, any comments on this before we wrap up? They should change the name of those Hoovervilles you're talking about to Bidenvilles because that's what's happening. It's, it's Bidenomics at work. That's right. We're seeing Biden economics, and it's not being reported yet, it, but the signs are there. And the middle class, the middle class is collapsing. When the middle class collapses. We have instability politically. You're seeing uh, Jim Jordan lost the first vote in the House to be Speaker. That's not such a bad thing. I, I, I want to jump in there. That, that's not such a bad thing because you can't just you can't just coron uh, you can't just have a coronation after a couple of failed uh, uh, attempts to get a Speaker in. And of course, the McCarthy overthrow. You know, there are going to be people who are upset. So both sides should get together, or all sides should get together and figure this thing out. Um, come to a consensus, a real good one, because the fact is you have a thin, you have a thin majority. You can't, I don't, and I also don't like the idea that the, that Republicans should be marching in lockstep either. I, I don't, I was watching the dem, I was watching the roll call. There were times where Democrats were chanting in unison. I don't want a party like that. I want a party which will squabble and argue and, and have, a, uh, some people fighting for real Americans and saying, Hey, you guys in the establishment aren't doing something right. We're, we might be 20 of us or eight of us, and we're going to stand up and say no. I, I don't mind that. Well, again, American politics has been raucous from the beginning. If we go back and study the how Congress worked in the early 1800s, there were fights and squabbles all the time. And even presidential elections were pretty difficult when you had the whoever was first was president, whoever was second was vice president. They didn't run as a ticket. Uh, there were some vicious fights that went on in early American politics, and we survived. So I agree with you. I think Jordan has a good chance to emerge as House Speaker, but it's going to take some time. It may take two or three votes, and they may do a lot of arm twisting before it's resolved. But eventually, the Republicans are going to have, you know, they can't concede power back to the Democrats. Can't let the Democrats pick a Speaker. The Democrats will certainly pick a Speaker, and they'll be radical. And, you know, we're headed into a presidential election, and the disruptive force in that election is Robert Kennedy. And I think Robert Kennedy as an independent is going to cause massive disruption and could, it's going to be debatable whether he's going to take more votes from Trump or more votes from whomever the Democrats run. And I do not think Biden will be the candidate. So we're, we're headed into one of the more turbulent times in American politics. But Chris, let me wrap it up because we're running just a little bit over time. Uh, in the end, God always wins. God will win here too. Now, we're facing a judgment of God. We have allowed God to be taken out of schools, out of our hearts, out of our marriages. We're not raising children with the values to appreciate that they're here with the grace of God, uh, that it takes the grace of God to be saved. And what we understand, we have to understand that killing babies in the womb is a great disgrace to God, it's taking life away. And Spirit of 711, uh, 711, 7, 2 Chronicles 714, and I guess it is my, one of my mind is emergency kind of 711, you know, this is, this is a crisis, 911, whatever. It's a crisis. Uh, the crisis is brought upon us for us to realize our sins and what we've done to allow this to happen. We need to get down on our knees and beg God's forgiveness. And collectively, we should do this. I'm doing it this for all. That all should join in. We should all do this for all. To say we are asking God's forgiveness. It, what Second Chronicles 7, 14 says is that if we do this, God will hear, hear our prayer and heal our land. And it's going to take God's intervention here. Uh, and uh, the seriousness of this time is extreme. 
but I've come to think that we will survive it. And there's enough people who do believe in God and who are praying that God will have mercy and that we will get through this period of time. This Dr. Jerome Corsi today is Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Thank you for joining us. TheTruthCentral.com. Please spread the word. We're doing podcasts every weekday. God bless.